Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, interviews with folks who have special insights into education from preschool all the way through adult education. I'm Jim Sean, your host. We're streaming live every Wednesday at noon, also posted on YouTube and the Hawaii Educational Policy Center. Today's guest has been involved in an interesting aspect of supporting charter schools in Hawaii, Dr. Megan McCorrison, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yes, and uh, you are executive director of an organization called Ho'okako, right? That's correct. Now, what does that mean? Well, Ho'okako in its Hawaiian translation means to support. Okay. Uh, which basically describes the work of our nonprofit organization, which is to support conversion charter schools throughout Hawaii. Okay. Yeah. So let's start. What is your educational background? Well, I had a long career in education as a student before I became uh, a teacher and then later on an administrator. Uh, so I began my work as a, uh, a teacher, as I mentioned, um, studied to be an English lit major, thought I was going to be a writer for many years until I found it too difficult and decided to pursue my graduate degree in education. Mm -hmm. um, I got a master's and a PhD from the University of Oxford in England. Wow. Um, yeah, where I studied international education theory and then pursued the PhD to do some action research around inclusive education policies for refugees and asylum seekers in that country. Oh, wow. That's an, another show about education <laughs> in the future, perhaps. Yeah. But now, okay, so did you, you taught for a while after that? Or? I did. I taught after my master's, but a funny story, which um, some folks who have worked with me actually have heard before. Um, I came back to Hawaii to be a teacher in the public school system. I knew that I wanted to be a public school and teacher. And you, you grew up in Hawaii? I grew up in Hawaii, yeah. yep. Mm -hmm. And your high school was? Went to Punahou. Okay. Um, and so I came back to be a teacher in the public system because I had taught for stints in the private system and mm -hmm. uh, really found that where I wanted to be, uh, I guess, the most useful would was the public system, and I ended up teaching at Radford School, which was wonderful mm -hmm. uh, for a brief moment. But the NCLB had just come about. Mm -hmm. um, I think no it was Child a, Left Behind. This is, yes, the No Child Left Behind policy, which required teachers to be highly qualified. So although I had done my master's in education at a you know, very prestigious university uh, abroad, uh, the DOE at that time did not consider me highly qualified to be in a high school classroom teaching English mm -hmm. to the kids. And that was actually one of the major motivations for me to go back, to go back to England, do my graduate studies, get a PhD in education, and really work on education reform in the state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so along come the charter schools in yes. Ho'okako. Yeah. Uh, and uh, describe a little bit how Ho'okako got started. Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I just want to add something quickly before yes. we move on to that, which is, you know, when I graduated high school and left Hawaii, which was in 1993 now, um, the charter schools were really, uh, the movement were just starting. So when I intended to come back and work here in Hawaii, it was really to work with the DOE. Mm -hmm. Didn't really realize that charters were much of a movement. Um, so interesting, you know, that around that time, I want to say in 2002, um, Kamehameha Schools decided to take on a real risk and began this idea for a nonprofit support organization mm -hmm. um, that would work with converting schools from DOE schools to charter uh, with the intent in Native Hawaiian communities, of course, with the intention of improving the educational opportunities for Native Hawaiian children. And, and they, that, they went to the legislature to get a special law for that, correct? That's correct. It was yeah. a lot of work, as I understand it, from board members at that time mm -hmm. and the former executive director, Lynn Fallon, who did a lot of work at the you know, legislature to advocate for you know, better conditions for charter schools and to work with the unions on you know, what it would entail to convert a school from DOE to charter. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone at that time realized what a big effort that would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it certainly was and continues to be. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that process, right? Mm -hmm. You've got a DOE school, and in this case, uh, for Ho'okako and Kamehameha's interest, uh, a community that's primarily Native Hawaiian or a certain percentage mm -hmm. in, that, in that DOE school? That's right. Um, so they were, I, I don't think, ever really prescriptive in terms of the numbers of Hawaiian students, but it was you know, very clear that on the island of Molokai, the only uh, charter school there is Kualapu'u Elementary, mm -hmm. uh, which is a conversion school. Um, so looking at that community, which is almost 90% Native Hawaiian or even above 90% uh, Native Hawaiian, you know, clearly that was uh, one of the mm -hmm. sweet spots for Kamehameha. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have two other schools, one in the Waianae uh, District and another on Hawaii Island in Waimea. 
Mm. And Kamehameha's commitment was to put in, by law actually, mm -hmm. $1 for every $4 that the state put in. That's correct. And the funding is really important because, you know, as part of Kamehameha's effort, they're extending the reach out into other communities that, mm -hmm. you know, may not, um, you know, with children who may not go to the private school who, you know, mm -hmm you know, with an effort to increase the educational opportunities for those children in those communities. So while the DOE schools were serving many children, there was an opportunity to create a new type of school um, with a specific view to how, you know, Native Hawaiian learners and how they learn. Mm -hmm. So you have this school in a Native Hawaiian community, mm -hmm. and how do they convert? Uh, what, is, what does this start with? I mean, does someone I always uh, <laughs> walk in the door and say, hey, would you like to convert? or you know, there must be some kind of a democratic process, yes? That's, that's correct. Um, so I always say it takes a village. Um, there is, a, according to the new law, the new charter law that came about in 2012, there is a very specific process uh, that communities must go through to convert a school. But back then, it really required a majority of the school community um, to take a vote as to whether or not the DOE school would convert to charter. Mm -hmm. And that community is described as a number of stakeholders from within the school community, meaning um, I think at least 50% of the people in your school community from your uh, teaching staff, you know, your uh, certified staff, um, classified staff, um, parents, mm -hmm. um, administrators, of course, they all must take this vote together, and then mm -hmm. if at least 50% vote yes, they convert to charter. I That's see. So, so it really is a consensus uh, process. It really is. Yeah, mm -hmm. and everybody has to buy into it. Mm -hmm. uh, so does, you know, after the vote, are they automatically charters, or is this is a process of transition, or... Yeah, when our schools converted, it was all prior to the new law, as I mentioned yeah. before. So uh, it was different for all three of our schools, but they all went through a very rigorous application process with, at that time, the Charter School Review Panel, which has mm -hmm. since become the Charter School Commission in the state of Hawaii. Um, and so, it, no, it didn't happen right away. And as I mentioned, the board, uh, the Ho'okako board at that time, was in negotiations with all our important stakeholder groups throughout the state with, with DOE, very importantly, with the HSTA. Uh, because there were a lot of questions, frankly speaking, this was uncharted territory at that right. time. Yeah. There were a lot of questions about teachers retaining their status. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what would happen to teacher tenure if they were to go to the charter school? Would they have return rights to the DOE if they decided they no longer wanted to work for the charter at that time? So there were major questions uh, mm -hmm. for employees of the DOE school at that time, and a lot of fear, frankly, around, uh, you know, sort of jumping in with this experiment with yeah. all of us. Mm -hmm. So the, the carrot for this was presumably Kamehameha, more funding, right? Uh, were there other aspects to why a school would want to take that leap? Absolutely. Um, our principals would always tell you that um, a big motivation for them was to, uh, you know, really have the opportunity as a principal to be the leader of that school, to make critical decisions in terms of instruction and curriculum for the children in their community. Mm -hmm. It is really true having worked with, um, you know, being based out of Honolulu and working with these schools in very different communities and remote communities throughout Hawaii that mm -hmm. the people in those communities where the schools are located know their schools best and they should be empowered to make those decisions for the children in their schools. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, flexibility or as we say autonomy uh, that those schools were given was very important to the school leaders at that time. So the model for the regular, if you want to call it, startup charters, is they have a governing board. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but it's slightly different when they converted initially with Ho'okako because the Ho'okako board became their mm -hmm. governing board, right? Yeah, it's, you know, didn't start as organically as other charters have in that sense because, you know, you had a ready-made board. Um, again, um, most of those people identified from different parts of the community, the greater Hawaii, state of Hawaii community. So whereas mm -hmm. most charter schools, <clears throat> excuse me, have boards that are located in their local communities, our board was comprised of people from the business community throughout Hawaii, um, uh, education community. There was a, somebody from HEIS as executive director on the board, Good Beginnings Alliance for Early Childhood. Mm -hmm. um, so they brought all this expertise you know, through their role as board members to the schools, and, and that was considered, I think, a benefit to these schools as well. Mm -hmm. And, and the schools that convert, of course, they retain an obligation, do they not, to that community to be the public school 
in the same way that they were a catchment area for public school students. That's correct. There's a lot of, uh, I guess, misunderstanding around what it means to be a conversion school. So although you uh, convert to a charter school, you still retain that uh, function as the neighborhood school for all the students in that district. So we don't practice selection at our charter schools. We take everybody inside the district. We get a lot of requests from people outside the district to send their children to school. Uh -huh. And we often do accept that. I mean, we have to create policies that are approved by the state commission and, mm -hmm. and go mm -hmm. through that process, but we, we take everybody. We believe every child deserves a shot at the best education they can have. So it is possible for a child that lives outside of the traditional DOE neighborhood lines of demarcation for that school to transfer it in or apply to enter that charter school now? It is possible. It doesn't happen that frequently. Right. And, and of course, there are different reasons why families would want to send their kid uh, or their child to a school outside right. of their own district. But the priority is given to students in our neighborhoods. I see. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when a school converts, uh, or when a school starts for charter, they kind of assemble their own administrative staff, right, from mm -hmm. scratch, right? right, you know. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference for the conversions? There is a huge difference, mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, part of the interesting feature of conversion schools is that uh, the principal of that school will carry over, um, uh, you know, into the charter school. So the principal of the DOE school, it, it you know, it requires a very strong school leader, I think, to take that leap of faith, to accept, uh, you know, less per pupil funding for each of their students, mm -hmm. and to say, you know, I'm going to make a go of this because I really believe in what's best for the instruction mm -hmm. and learning in my school. Um, and so our, our principals did convert from the DOE to the charter school. And um, I will say, in terms mm -hmm. of the teaching staff, though, they probably lost half of their faculty members. Oh, because, because they wanted to stay in the... DOE system. Yeah, there was a lot more security and safety, I uh -huh. think, in that choice and, uh -huh. uh, you know, fear of the unknown. I'm mm -hmm. sure everybody can appreciate that. When you say the principal converted, though, they, they are still part of HGEA, the Union for Principals. That's correct. Yeah, a yeah. big part of Ho'okako's work, meaning our nonprofit staff, um, has been to support the schools in those negotiations to do collective bargaining for our schools and to really come up with some innovative, uh, with an innovative approach to mm -hmm. those agreements mm -hmm. to um, secure extended learning time and funding for our teachers, uh, to work a longer school day, to do more within that day for the students. So that's been an exciting process. But the principal's not the only one that sort of you know, was there from be before and is there now. The administrative staff also was kind of converted, is that? The administrative the, staff convert, that's right. And, yeah. and it's a choice, as I understand it. You know, they can decide to convert with the school or take another job with the DOE. I see. So, so and there must be a lot of dialogue with the community as well uh, when this happens. Absolutely, and there's a lot of education that needs to happen around, you know, what are the benefits of going charter? Mm -hmm. Why would a school uh, decide to make such a drastic move like that? Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to inform your community, to educate your parents, and to do that wholesale uh, throughout your community so that people really understand the benefit it's bringing to your children. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the Kamehameha connection with the Hawaiian community, I suppose, is also part of that discussion, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. They, uh, you know, parents in your community need to understand who the school's community partners are going to be and how they're going to provide that support to the school. Um, as we all know, charter schools throughout the state can't do it without the support of their community partners. Mm -hmm. Well, we are talking with Megan McCorston, who is executive director of an organization that supports conversion charter schools. We'll be back in one minute. Aloha, my name is Justine Espiritu and I co-host Hawaii Farmers Series with Matthew Johnson of Oahu Fresh. We talk about Hawaii's local farmers and their supporters. In order to have a vibrant and sustainable local food system, uh, farmers are always the foundation, but there's so many other people uh, involved in the community that help support those farmers. So we bring those folks onto our show every Thursday at 4 p.m. 
we get their backstory, their history, find out a little more about them, and we find out why they love what they do and their perspective and their advice on how we can continue to have a dynamic and vibrant and sustainable local food system. So we, again, we broadcast live every Thursday at 4 p.m. And you can also catch us on ThinkTech's YouTube channel as well as Alelo 54. So we hope you tune in and join us. Thank you. Welcome back to Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. We're talking about conversion charter schools with Dr. Megan McCorston. Mm -hmm. uh, from Oxford University, okay. Uh, let's, let's back up a little bit. What is a charter school for anybody listening and maybe doesn't have a clear idea of what it is and what it isn't? Right, that's a great question. I think it's important to remind everybody that charter schools are public schools, first of all. Um, there are two types of public schools now in our state. There are DOE schools and charter schools. And charter schools are uh, free to parents that want to send their kids there. There's no, t they can't charge tuition. Um, and our conversion charter schools are no different. They are uh, free public schools mm -hmm. for the public, and in our case, they are the neighborhood school uh, for that community. And they are governed by collective bargaining like any other state agency. That's correct. These negotiations, which we'll get into in a minute, uh, and um, uh, same standards, same mm -hmm. tests as the DOE schools. Uh, so it's designed as a governance model, even though they get less money. Yes. That's correct. Yes. Can you talk a little <laughs> bit about the financial challenges sure. for a charter? Sure. So just in the uh, short time that I've been working with charter schools, I think in the last five or six years, I've seen the um, funding for charter schools take a steady decline. I know that at one time when our schools became conversion schools, uh, the state per pupil funding was about 9000 per child. And we've seen a steady decline to where it is now at just above uh, 6,000 per child. So um, there have been different studies on charter school funding. And, and you know, with some exceptions, I think it's fair to say that it, it's about half of what a DOE school might get per child. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it is really difficult and um, incumbent upon us to uh, really be aggressive about finding our own resources, um, looking for additional sources of revenue and sustainable sources of funding for a mm -hmm. charter school so mm -hmm. that we're not just uh, looking for money year after year, which is a real distraction for principals who have a big job to do, mm -hmm. you know, at our schools and, and governing boards. So governing boards tend to take on more of that, um, as well as the charter school directors. Um. Mm -hmm. Now, the, there is an official charter school office that's staff for the commission, but that has evolved as well. You want to talk a little bit about how that has changed? The role of the office in the yes, state, yeah. sure. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, at one time it was the Charter School Review Panel. I think there was a lot of confusion prior to the uh, new charter law that came about in 2012. Um, I sat on the task force with Jill Takuda, actually, that created the new law. And so there were just a lot of questions from task force members and the public, frankly, about, you know, what the panel's role was. Were they empowered to, um, you know, let's say, shut down an underperforming school? Um, on the task force, we took a look at a lot of national examples of charter systems throughout uh, the country, you know, realizing that we didn't have to reinvent the wheel here. So we took a look at that literature. We contracted with uh, some national folks um, mm -hmm. to do a study for us and came up with a new system that we have. Um, so the Charter School Commission's role is to really be the, the authorizer of mm -hmm. charter schools in the state of Hawaii, meaning they will review charter school applications, new charter schools, um, you know, uh, institutions wanting to become charter schools and review those applications and approve them and then um, allow them to come into being. But they've come up with a whole new set of administrative rules and that schools must mm -hmm. follow. So all charter schools that are currently in the system are going through this process of uh, trying to understand what those rules mean for us, how we conform to the new system. Um, and basically the biggest change out of that process has been the introduction of a charter school contract. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the role of Ho'okako as supporting a charter school that maybe doesn't have the kind of supports that the DOE has, uh, which is, um, uh, uh, you know, it's got district level and complex area level support and state level. There's some like eight to 900 people at the state level in mm -hmm. the DOE, right? So you have a lot of people 
supporting the system mm -hmm. for DOE schools, and then you have Ookako, what do you do? <laughs> That's a great question, and uh, I think we're still going through an evolution ourselves. As I mentioned at the start of our interview, um, there was, you know, Kamehameha Schools in the beginning in 2002 that set us up to be um, really a nonprofit, uh, you know, fundraising arm for the schools and a pass through for the Kamehameha Schools money. So we supported the schools very directly in that. Um, as we've evolved to meet the demands of the new charter system, um, we find ourselves needing to play a bigger support role for our schools and perhaps mm -hmm. other schools in the future. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned just now, um, our charter schools here in Hawaii don't have the support of a DOE and different departments that do professional development for your teachers or, you know, uh, collect data. And so all of these are needs within our charter system that have to be met somehow. And the discussion in our charter community right now is that nonprofits can probably pay, play a bigger role in supporting our schools. Mm -hmm. And Ho'okako has very clearly defined itself as a support service. Uh, we aren't in the business of just governing our schools or managing them, which is part of our function. It's a necessary part of our function. Uh, but we also have very um, specific areas of support for our schools. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so in the past five years, I've grown our staff to support the schools in a number of areas, including financial management, human resources, which would include um, your point about collective bargaining and that mm -hmm. type of support, um, <clears throat> as well as educational supports to the principals. You know, what do they need? What are the latest innovations out there in education? What can we learn from, you know, uh, education elsewhere and bring that to our charter schools and look at scaling up really successful initiatives that are great for teachers, great for students. Mm -hmm. um, that is another service that we uh, provide our schools with. So. So uh, let's look a little bit at the collective bargaining realm, right? Mm -hmm. I, I imagine a school that has never had to deal with this idea of somebody else always mm -hmm. negotiated the contracts, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have a specialist that, that helps negotiate for those schools? We do. It's a, I've come to appreciate. It's not my background either. So yeah. I've come to appreciate that's a very specialized area where you, know, you need to be really clear. And again, it goes back to what you're saying about how charter schools begin. You know, it's about circling back with your community and understanding what's most important to them, to your teachers, to your administrators about educating those children to ensure that the contract mm -hmm. really reflects that. Mm -hmm. And so we take a lot of time in preparing for these negotiations with the union and talking to our staff, talking to our teachers, and talking to our administrators um, mm -hmm. uh, about what those needs are to make sure that we have some alignment before we even start the process. And have those negotiations gone well? Are they difficult? Are they smooth? Uh, They're not always easy, but I must say, I, I think, um, you know, relatively speaking, we've had a lot of success uh, with our collective bargaining uh, negotiations, particularly in respect of our HSTA negotiations. Um, uh, we have had a lot of successful innovations over the years with our teachers. We were quick to get a, um, excuse me, a supplemental agreement before the DOE had its master agreement. Mm -hmm. um, which was a few years ago. So we were uh, really on the ball with ensuring that our, our teachers had uh, the right supports in place for them in that school year. And the big things were around, as I mentioned before, extended learning time, mm -hmm. which is a benefit not only to our students because we can extend the learning opportunities for them, but for our teachers because it allows them more collaboration and planning time during the school day. Mm -hmm. We were successful in getting Kamiley Academy and y and I a pay for performance model, which was uh, again, part of our school improvement initiative at that time, uh, which allowed uh, the whole school to benefit from higher education success, academic success for their students. So all teachers really benefited from that. Well, explain what that is, pay for, for performance and what you did with it. Um, well, a lot of people refer to it as a teacher incentive model. Uh -huh. uh, Kamiley Academy's teachers did a great job in coming up with a model that I said was more uh, universal. So whereas the individual teacher would receive uh, more money, frankly, for uh, seeing increased uh, proficiency in reading and math for their students, um, the whole school was rewarded. If, as, if the whole school, it was a three-tiered system where individual uh, teachers, their PLC groups, which means their professional learning communities, which, as I, as I mentioned before, they mm -hmm. do planning together. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the PLC group did well with those students, and as well as the whole school, then they would all receive a sort of financial, uh, you know, uh, oh, bump okay. for doing well okay. with those students. So does that mean that a teacher at, in, in that school with that negotiation would, would maybe make more money than a teacher in the D, if, if they were in that uh, same DOE school? 
without being chartered? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Comiley is in a, a hard to fill area. Where uh -huh. The entire Waianae district is considered hard to fill, so we traditionally have a lot of trouble recruiting in that area, recruiting mm -hmm. you know, quality teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's especially difficult in a charter school in Waianae. So that is one of the ways in which we can reward teachers with the pay for performance model, but also focus on recruiting and retaining high talent in our community. It sounds like this is a, an attractive model for other schools to use in their negotiations. Are you seeing an interest in, in that model? No, I think, I think uh, the DOE was looking at it, I think, for, for maybe for a while as part of their Race to the Top initiative uh, and uh -huh. school improvement. It requires funding, you know, it's, uh -huh. it is tied to money, so that's always a concern for people. Um, but we felt it was, you know, we had a school improvement grant. We had three years uh, to introduce this innovation, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a great learning experience, I think, for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what other services do you provide your schools other than collective bargaining? As I mentioned, that we, we also uh, do, you know, a number of administrative services so that the principals at our schools can really focus on being the chief educational officers uh -huh. of their campuses. We really want them to focus on high quality instruction and learning for our kids and our teachers. So our office will take on the back end a lot of the uh, pressure off of them, if you will, in terms of making sure that they're in compliance with a lot of the federal and state requirements, mm -hmm. especially uh -huh. with the advent of the new charter school uh, commission requirements, um, making sure that they're performing, uh, they're aligned with our board policies and with their mm -hmm. the requirements of their charter school contract. Um, we um, also introduce education innovations, and I mentioned a few already. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at, we very importantly, we manage the finances of our schools. So we really provide that oversight and monitoring function for our schools, keep, you know, making sure that uh, we're not deviating from the plan, uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. you know, and um, and it actually we have, you know, using economies of scale, we're actually able, able to leverage the resources at all three of our schools to, mm -hmm. to provide those services. So it tends to work well in a charter management type of organization. So are you thinking about reaching out to others, uh, other schools for this sort of thing? Yeah, I would say that's been a dialogue uh, that our board has had for the, you know, last yeah. five years. but really focusing on the three schools that we have at the moment, we really want to do well by them and their school communities, ensure that we're getting it right with those schools before expanding our model. Um, I think given where the charter system is at though, in terms of schools needing certain services from some nonprofit uh, type of provider, uh, we could look at expanding that model. If not governing and managing those schools, then mm -hmm. simply maybe providing services, support services to smaller charter schools, a start of charter schools, in fact, needing those services. So where do you get your funding? Now, Kamehameha is not funding you anymore, right? That's right. Well, we are on a, a sort of annual funding cycle with uh, other Kamehameha-supported charter schools. So okay. we will apply to, uh, you know, for Kamehameha funding on an annual basis, just like any other charter school. Um, as one of their collaborators. So uh, we, we do receive some support from Kamehameha Schools. We also um, have started a big fundraising initiative on the level of our board. Mm -hmm. um, and our schools have been heavily involved. Our school communities have done a great job jumping on board with this. And so we have a number of other private uh, funding sources. And we go after federal grants all the time mm -hmm. um, that are applicable to us which can be tricky as a charter school and as a charter organization mm -hmm. because, and, and I won't get into this too much because that's another show, mm -hmm. but um, you know, as charter schools, we don't have our own local education authority, which makes it very difficult for charter schools to access all the federal funding that could really help their uh, students in their schools. Because that's a requirement. You have to be a so-called LEA, local education agency, to qualify for certain funding, right? That's correct. And not to get too technical about it, but because the state is a single education authority, we don't have what other states have, which are local education authorities, which would comprise schools in their, in their local areas. I see. And they have, um, you know, therefore they have access to those uh, federal funds. It sounds like you do have a high power board, though, that might be able to raise funds in ways that a very small community board might not. That's the theory, yeah. you know? It's very hard to, I think, uh, to, to wrap your head around, you know, giving money to a public school, because a lot of people obviously think that, you know, these are publicly funded institutions. Yes. Why do they need to fundraise? So we've had to do a lot of educating before we could even, um, in our own school communities, in fact, before mm -hmm. we could even move ahead with our development effort. And, but I've been really impressed. It's been incredible to see how many people are willing to give of their own pockets uh, 
to really support what's in the best interest of our children. So the generosity in Hawaii is overwhelming. Okay, well, we're talking with Megan McGorriston about conversion charter schools and how their organization supports them. And we'll be back in one minute. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I host Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. And I do this because I care about science literacy in Hawaii. I want to spread the understanding that science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. I want to make sure the broadest possible spectrum of people understand the beauty and the value of science and realize that science plays out each and every day of their lives. I want you to understand that science is fun. So we bring on to this show each week guests or scientists, from astronomers to zoologists, and we talk about what they do and how they do it. But most importantly, we talk about why you should care about their work, why you should see that their work has value and impact on your life. So I hope you'll join us Fridays, 1 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. You can watch us via live stream. You can watch us uh, recorded on Olelo, and you can see us uh, each week. We hope you'll join us. Welcome back to Education Movers, Shakers, Reformers. We're talking about conversion charter schools, the kind of supports any charter schools needs. And, and you've, let's just recap now, the evolution of this organization, Ho'okako, as it has been in the context of how our charter system has, has changed. So it started off with Kamehameha funding and, mm -hmm. you know. And we're operating more and more like an independent nonprofit that like an does independent its own one, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, development and fundraising for our schools. And, and the state office started as a, like the DOE, support and hold them accountable. And now the staff for the commission is primarily hold accountable, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that, that whole proactive support element has been shifted back to the schools or to Hohokako, yes. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. so that's right. So you, you said the organization is debating and, and wondering how it can move into this new environment. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that discussion. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think what's underlying all of this in this discussion is yeah. the fact that you know we made these changes uh, to the law because let's face it, there's a lot of criticism out there around charter schools. There have been a lot of uh, negative press about charter schools and what. Mm -hmm. Uh, the degree to which we're accountable for our public funding and, mm -hmm. and questions about what we're really doing for kids. So I think uh, we all acknowledge that uh, those concerns are out there. And in response to that, you know, we've created this new body, the Charter School Commission, mm -hmm. as you just described, whose main function is to hold schools accountable for high student performance, um, you know, making sure that students are progressing each year and not mm -hmm. falling down, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that they're fiscally responsible and of course organizationally sound. So mm -hmm. those are three really important areas that we have to focus on going forward. So, you know, and it's requiring a lot of our schools to step up their game. Um, not that they weren't already doing these things and mm -hmm. ensuring that these things were in place, but it is a lot of work to comply. So our, our you know, our, non, our nonprofit, Ho'okako, has yeah. evolved to sort of meet those demands. Um, we've always provided uh, services to our schools in the way of uh, school monitoring, monitoring school performance, you know, mm -hmm. monitoring the finances, m making sure that our, our employees are, are taken care of, that, you know, payroll gets done, mm -hmm. and sort of these technical functions, aspects of schools that aren't that interesting to principals who've really come along this path and become educators for a much different reason. Mm -hmm. So this allows, as I mentioned before, our, our school principals to focus on what they do best, which is to oversee the curriculum and instruction and assessment choices of their school. Now, actually, the majority of charter schools in the state are in rural communities, neighbor islands or Waianae Coast or whatnot. This must give you folks a particular insight into an important aspect of charters that, you know, it's not urban as mm -hmm. much as it is in many mainland cities, which it's an urban growth phenomenon. Uh, talk a little bit about the rural nature of your schools their needs and, and other charters that are in similar circumstances? Mm. Yeah, I w that's a great question, mm. actually, and one that often doesn't get asked. 
But I think that one of the greatest challenges uh, in these rural communities is access to human resources. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody were to leave the school, you know, we have a very difficult time recruiting them. And this came up recently in a, in a dialogue with Kamehameha Schools. Um, one of the things we're always trying to do a better job of is recruiting you know, highly uh, talented staff and administrators and teachers uh -huh. for our schools. And board members, too, as well. And yeah. board members. Yeah. Although we are a board that's mainly based in Honolulu, we are yeah. comprised of community members from our school communities. So yeah. we rely heavily on the expertise and knowledge um, of our school community folks uh, mm -hmm. to recommend people to our board from their communities. Mm -hmm. But it's a real challenge. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons why somebody from one of our school communities would move elsewhere, either for jobs, um, mm -hmm. We sometimes lose students for that reason as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting to track that data to figure out uh, solutions mm -hmm. to those problems. And that's one way in which our office really supports the schools, because mm -hmm. principals don't have a lot of time to focus on those issues. It, it does sound, though, that there are a lot of different kinds of charters by their own community definition, by their own missions. Uh, is, is there such a thing as a unified charter community in Hawaii? I think people have often said no, mm -hmm. but you know, there are, and it's interesting working as an organization with three very different charter schools in three uh -huh. different communities. I think you could take Ho'okako as an example of a microcosm of that, uh -huh. of that fact. And it is that, you know, although our schools are, they look very different from one another, they're in mm -hmm. very different communities, mm -hmm. um, and those communities all feel different, they look different, uh, the education happening at the schools is slightly different. There are certain ways in which Ho'okako as a charter management organization can come up with common school policies and maybe initiatives and innovations mm -hmm. that support all students. Because at the end of the day, you know, looking at our student populations at all three schools, some of the neediest student populations throughout Hawaii, mm -hmm. high numbers of special education students, high numbers of uh, English language learners, or these are students with English as a second language or third language sometimes, um, and other types of students, um, you know, we are constantly trying to figure out what is the best way to ed uh -huh. provide educational supports to those students. And so Ho'okako takes a look at that, and we can, you know, as, as I said before, scale up certain successful initiatives. If something's working well at Kamaile, we'll share it with Waimea, we'll share it with Molokai. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned something that's part of a, an incorrect myth about charters, that, well, they don't have as many special ed students, or they don't, don't have as many ELL students, but you're telling us that, indeed, you have high numbers of those, yes? Yes, we have very high numbers of them. And shocking to me was, uh, you know, Kamiley's principal always talks about her transient rate at her school, which is shocking to me. But um, we know that there's a, a number of homeless uh, families that, mm -hmm. you know, live in the Waianae area, and particularly in Kamiley's area. And in fact, their transiency rate at that school is over 60%. 60%. That's correct. That's huge. It's huge. Yeah. So, so, so we have a lot of challenges that we face, the teachers face every day. You know, they don't know when a student's going to enter their classroom or leave their classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, that's, and it's obviously difficult for the child as well. Mm -hmm. so. It must be difficult also just for meeting the metrics of those two high-stake tests, right? If the kids are coming and going all the time. They are high stakes. So as a lot of charter schools do, we're always looking at different ways of assessing the children uh, mm -hmm. to assess their performance, to describe performance in other ways, not just academic performance, mm -hmm. but are they coming to school fed? Are they coming to school healthy? Uh -huh. Are they receiving health services? So uh, again, in the case of Kamile, they do a fantastic job providing a number of support services to the students uh -huh. to meet their social emotional needs as well as their academic needs. So uh, are they, you know, uh there, it sounds like a, it's a homeless center almost for uh, a big chunk of kids. Yes. It really has been as long as I've been working with the school. Uh -huh, mm -hmm. uh -huh. So you've seen the evolution of Ho'okako and the charters. Looking down the road, where do you see this all going? Do you see other Ho'okakos springing up? Do you see Ho'okako expanding to you know, fill that gap of services? Where's it all going? I'm going to say both one and two. Yes. I think you're kind of. I think you're kind of on target. I think there's a big need for Ho'okako to expand uh -huh. um, its services. I think we need to continue to provide those supports to our three schools as long as they want it. I think we have an opportunity to provide those supports to new schools, and I think that other charter schools in the sector should really consider maybe banding together because resources are so slim, mm -hmm. and that doesn't seem, 
it doesn't seem as though that's going to change in the mm -hmm. near future. Mm -hmm. So because we all have to live on a budget, and really live within a budget of 6000 per child, yes. which isn't a lot to run a school, as we all know, mm -hmm. um, we really need to band together, I think, pool our resources and look at what kind of sustainable model is out there for charter schools mm -hmm. to really ensure that we are receiving all the services that, as you said mm -hmm. at the start of this conversation, any mm -hmm. DOE school would receive from the DOE. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I imagine that if, if the per pupil amount was up what it was in 2006 or seven, there would be more interest in converting for, because so. you have more autonomy. Have you had discussions with other potential conversion schools? And yes, yes we have and it's always interesting. Um, I think since I began my job with Ho'okako there have been um, maybe two schools Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's of course La Pohoi Hoi that became a, ch a conversion charter school, mm -hmm. um, and and they are independently governed, of course, by a board in their local community, uh -huh. uh, which works for them. That works very well too. Wailai and Lanikai are other two well-known conversion charter schools that are doing very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yes, there is a lot of interest. Not all of them have decided, I think, to go there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very critical. The funding is very low and. Um, I think to put in an application, frankly, at this point in time, with the per pupil being as low as it is, it's very uncertain in terms of whether or not those schools would be successful with their application. So, well, that would be true of any new group that is applying to become a charter, I would imagine, yes? True. Yes. That's right. Yeah, so in, in, even though the cap has been raised on the number of charters allowed, mm -hmm. in reality, the financial cap has not been raised. Yeah. I think one thing that, uh, you know, Hawaii can do a better job of maybe is look, all of us, is looking at uh, national examples of really successful charter schools elsewhere in the country and looking mm -hmm. at what are the necessary conditions of success for those charter schools. What makes a conversion or startup charter school successful in another place? Uh -huh. Because although our community is different, our student populations might look a little bit different, the needs of learners are pretty um, Mm -hmm. Universal, you know mm -hmm. that doesn't mm -hmm. change whether you're studying in England like me or, you know, a, a teacher here in Hawaii. So mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, we need to be looking at that and look at our own system and our own what's happening in our state, and then try to measure up with uh, national standards. With with your briefly with your international perspective, mm -hmm. are there other charter-like movements in other countries? Yes, there are. Actually, surprisingly, I did a bit of desk research on that in England, and I was curious to find out, you know, whether or not charters were a thing there. So I talked to some old colleagues in England, and there is a charter movement there. It isn't called charter, uh -huh. um, but I think it kind of began uh, for similar reasons. Uh, you know, just the, the thinking that the public really deserves to have educational choices for mm -hmm. their students. Mm -hmm. And in England, they have a very old system where it's more of a class system, and, you know, people went to school based on their class. Uh -huh. And, uh -huh. of course, that's not democratic at all, right? right, right so right. so what we're trying to do here is a really democratic thing. We're trying to expand educational opportunities for all types of learners throughout our Hawaii community. Uh -huh. And I think that's where charters are always going to play a vital role. And the charters are, tend to be smaller schools as well, which is a whole mm -hmm. other aspect of attractiveness. Absolutely. For me personally, as a learner, I mean, I always gravitated towards the smaller institution. I always felt uh -huh. I would be lost in a big university system like the University of Hawaii, for example. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, I can understand why that's a, that's a positive educational choice for a lot of families. And certainly there is a lot to be said for that one-to-one -one interaction between a, a mm -hmm. child and a teacher. Mm -hmm. And in spite of all the financial and other challenges, it's interesting that the number one uh, academically achieving the school, high school in the state for the last few years has been a charter school. Mm -hmm. Byron B. Thompson has, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is always at the top of that list mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, you know, so it sounds like educational leadership, creativity and support all have to come together as well as financing to define success, right. yes? That's absolutely, you put it very well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and do you think Ho'okako would be proposing changes to the law or anything in the future? Is that, well, not any... Am I planting a seed there <laughs> for your, your board members who may be listening? Yes. Yes. Well, I think, I think we could. I think in time, yeah. I think, you know, in the next couple of years, we, we could look at that. Yeah. I would also like to see us work together with other uh, charter leaders throughout uh -huh. the sectors on what those important changes would be to the law. You know, what are our common interests so that we're approaching policymakers with a unified voice? Hmm. 
Well, we'll be looking forward to that proposed legislation and changes <laughs> and the evolution of Ho'okanko. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Jim Sean with Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, and we'll be back next week with another interesting guest. Aloha. <laughs>